Good morning, everybody. My name is Heidi Feldman. I'm one of the co-directors of uh, Child X 2018, and I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician here in the Department of Pediatrics at Stanford School of Medicine. Thank you all for coming. So you know, when I went to medical school, we were really fascinated by one gene, one trait. We were studying Mendelian genetics. And I think you can begin to see from this morning's presentation that one gene, one molecule is not going to be sufficient for explaining complex phenomena like aging or like the development of cancer. So continuing on that theme, we're going to tackle in this session an even more challenging area, mental health of children. And what I hope to show you through this presentation is that we need to think about complex systems at a biological level and all the way to a clinical, social, and cultural level. So the way this session is going to work is that our first presenter will focus on the biological level, and then our second panel will focus on the social level. So starting out, um, I'm really delighted to introduce you to Sergio Pasca. He is an assistant professor of psychiatry and behavioral science here at Stanford. And he's interested in the intricate processes that are responsible for pulling together systems within the nervous system and how those systems can go awry in various clinical conditions, including mental health disorders. He was trained as a medical doctor in Romania. His passion for research began very early as a medical student. And it culminated when he was accepted to Stanford in 2013 and was able to pursue postdoctoral fellowship um, here on campus. He is a rising international star. And I'm going to let him present his own work so you can see how exciting it is. Sergio. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you so much, uh, Heidi, for the uh, uh, gracious introduction. My lab here at Stanford is interested in uh, understanding the molecular and cellular basis of psychiatric disorders. And I'm in a department of psychiatry, so I always like to start my talks by telling you about my own anxieties and frustrations first. So I am convinced that whomever is interested in understanding psychiatric disorders suffers from what I call the oncology envy syndrome. This oncology envy syndrome essentially means that we feel this immense frustration seeing how fast cancer research has been moving in the last 20 to 30 years and how slow we've been moving in understanding psychiatric disorders. And I'm sure there are multiple explanations for this, and many of them probably already passed through your mind. But one of the main reasons why we've been so slow in moving towards precision medicine has to do with the fact that we cannot access the human brain. And by that, I mean we cannot access the human brain from patients at the molecular and cellular level. So for the last almost 10 years or so, um, I've been involved in work trying to derive in a dish, in a non-invasive way, human brain tissue, human neurons, and human glia um, coming from those patients. And I think there's no better way of actually illustrating that than through the eyes of a patient. And so when I actually opened my lab uh, almost four years ago, one of my first, first patients with autism uh, sent me a drawing of what he thought my lab was doing. And so he's actually already an accomplished, he's very high functioning. He's actually an accomplished composer. And um, he, you know, I want to paraphrase him because it's very difficult to explain what he actually, you know, thought about this. And so what he thought we were doing is climbing up a ladder and poking holes in people's brains and then using telescopes to look at neurons and astrocytes. So of course, we are very happy that he was even considering astrocytes, of course, as, as, as a study, uh, as a purpose of our research. And you will see that we actually are, care a lot about glia as well. But you know, I called him, and I Skyped with him often, and I said, you know, this is close to what we do, but this is not precisely what we do. So next morning, he sent me another drawing. And this is probably the most accurate representation of what we do. So again, to paraphrase him, he said, what I think you're doing is you're taking skin cells from this patient, 
and doing a mumbo jumbo to this, those cells, turning them into stem cells, and then using those cells to make neurons and glia. And this is precisely the platform of research that we're uh, using in the lab. And to some extent, this has been successful. And I want to give you one of the early examples uh, of, of this type of research where we actually took skin cells from a patient that has a very specific form of autism. We derived stem cells in a non-invasive way, so we essentially reprogrammed those cells to go back in time and look and behave like pluripotent stem cells. And because pluripotent stem cells can become any other cell type, we guided them to become and uh, uh, to look and sort of behave like neurons. And you can see one of those neurons so like moving here in a dish over a period of time. So when we derived neurons from patients and controls and we looked at their arborization, at how complex those arborization are, especially when they're receiving electrical activity, we realized that the patient cells, instead of extending their dendrites when they're receiving electrical input, were actually retracting their dendrites. So this is one example of a cellular feature that we can observe with patient cells in a dish that we would not have had otherwise the chance to look at. But of course there are challenges moving ahead. These cultures look a little bit like what you see in this image, right? A cluster of neurons that are sitting at the bottom of a dish. But the human brain is very different than that. First of all, it has many different cell types many of them born in different parts of the brain that have to actually move across large uh, distances, millimeters very often to centimeters in humans, to actually wire up with other cell types and form circuits. And so one of the things that we proposed a number of years ago is whether we could not, of course, reconstitute the entire um, brain circuit, but at least get closer uh, to what a four years old would think of a brain. So this is an image actually of our four years old son, um, of what he thinks the brain looks like. So our initial goals were very simple in trying to at least get close to this. So we think that to some extent we have succeeded, and this is um, one of the uh, early examples of the technology that we developed, um, which in short uh, allows us to build in three dimension uh, human brain tissue in a dish. And this is work actually that was started by uh, Anka, who's a neonatologist here, and then continued then by Stephen Sloan, an MD-PhD student at Stanford. And essentially, the method is very simple. We take the stem cells and we force them to detach for those, from those dishes, and we move them to another dish that does not allow them to attach. And so what the stem cells actually do very shortly after is they start curling and making these small uh, uh, balls of cells that we subsequently guide into becoming neurons, and as you will see later, specify into becoming very specific brain regions. So just to illustrate, they look a little bit like this after about two weeks. Now, if you have patients um, and you wait for about 60 days, you will see that on the right, that sort of like white uh, ball of cells is one of these three-dimensional cultures, which now go by name, many names. We call them cortical spheroids, or they're called region-specific brain organoids. Uh, but they're essentially three-dimensional cultures that reach up to three to four millimeters in size. In this case, as you can see, they're similar in size to a uh, mouse brain at mid-gestation. So that is, on the left, is a mouse brain at mid-gestation. Now, one of the advantages is, beyond the fact that they're actually uh, created in a dish non-invasively, this technology is highly scalable. And you can actually develop many, many of these three-dimensional cultures. Thousands at any given uh, uh, time uh, can be maintained uh, by one person in a lab. And so one of the first uh, questions that we asked when we obtained these three-dimensional blobs of cells was how similar are they to the human brain? And so what we did is we use uh, uh, transcriptional data of the actual human brain and try to map our cultures to see how far in development we can go. And one of the surprising things was that although conventional cultures would usually go to the first um, 8 to 12 weeks of gestation, our cultures, even after just 10 weeks of culture, were already into the mid-gestation, so uh, second trimester uh, uh, of, uh, of life. And so... We then moved on and we tried to see how similar they are inside to the human brain. And so this is a human brain at mid-gestation that is shown here to be cross-section. And if you were to look inside, you will see that there, are, there is a ventricle in the middle 
And then the cortex, the outer layer of the brain, the one that is really responsible for cognition and memory and many of the higher brain functions, is really on the outside. But then if you were to look even farther, the cortex has multiple layers. It has close to the ventricle progenitors that are called radial glia. Then on the outside, there are progenitors that are called intermediate progenitors that are really important for the expansion of the human cortex. And indeed, if you were to take this three-dimensional cultures, this brain organoids or spheroids that we have derived, and you were to section them, you can see that they have a ventricle-like region right in the middle, that there are progenitors that resemble the radial glia-like right on the outside, that there, are, uh, that there are intermediate progenitors that are right on the outside of that region as well, and that even cell divisions happen in a very predictable way, in the sense that cells actually move down, undergo mitosis, and then they move up, a phenomenon that has been described uh, in the human brain. Now, this is how it looks actually in a cross-section. Um, so you see that the cells are actually arranged around the ventricle-like region, and the nuclei are actually perpendicular to that surface. Now, the other, um, I think, advantage of our method is that these uh, uh, blobs of cells are actually life. So what you can actually do is you can take them, uh, image them, um, and look at how the cells actually behave. So in this case, we actually labeled radial glia cells in green here, um, the, the cells that are really close to the ventricle. And you will see um, in, in what interesting way they actually divide. So you will see that there is a, a cell that moves close to the ventricle, divides in two, and then uh, there are two cells, and the daughter cell starts moving on top of the mother cell to actually probably take the appropriate position. Um, again, reminiscent of what happens in the mammalian brain. Now, if you were to wait even longer in human brain development, you will notice that beyond those progenitor populations, there are deep layer cortical neurons and there are superficial layer cortical neurons. And indeed, if you were to wait for about 20 weeks or more um, in, for our cultures, you will notice that in the center or close to one of the edges, you can notice the previous ventricular zones, but then the deep layer and superficial cortical layer neurons, which are arranged across uh, around that region. Now, we've been spending a lot of time not just in further developing this technology, but in even trying to see how reliable and scalable this process is. And now we know that we can actually differentiate within a year um, three-dimensional cultures from close to 100 subjects using this improved method um, that we have actually not published yet. Moreover, we spend a lot of time seeing how close these cultures are to themselves and to cultures derived from other subjects. As you can see, for instance, in this uh, image um, of 25,000 single cells being analyzed here across four different individuals and seeing how close these cultures are and uh, correlation is close to 0.8. Now, one of the goals very early on was not just to obtain neurons, but to also, uh, also obtain glial cells inside these cultures because glial cells are not just bystander cells, but they're actively involved in the function of the brain. And I will get back to this uh, several times in my talk. And indeed, very early on, we noticed that outside those ventricular regions, in between neurons, which are here shown in red, you can see this, um, this green cyan cells um, that go in between. And indeed, if you were to reconstruct them using array tomography, uh, you can see that there are these processes of glial cells all over the place in these cultures. And indeed, the number of glial cells goes up with time and reaches about 20% after about six months of cultures or so, and essentially stays flat. Why do we care so much about astrocytes? Well, there are multiple reasons, but I want to show you one image that I think is very telling. This is how a rodent astrocyte looks like. Uh, it, uh, and this is how a human astrocyte looks like. And they're at scale here. There's the same scale. So there's a lot of evidence pointing to the fact that astrocytes in humans have become more complex and have diverged transcriptionally, in certain instances even more so than neurons. But the challenge is that these astrocytes are actually born at late stages of gestation, second, third trimester, and soon after birth. And we've literally not had access to the cell type before. And so one of the questions that we asked early on in maintaining these cultures, and again, in trying to address this maturation issue, is like how long can we actually keep these cultures? And indeed, you know, we see that astrocytes are maturing and they're changing in shape over time. This is how one of our astrocytes looks in these cultures at about a year of culture. But to the extent that we, can, we know, we can keep these cultures indefinitely. We've been keeping them for over 850 days and they can keep going. Um, 
of course, they don't have an immune system, so there are all kinds of challenges that I'm happy to talk about in how to maintain them um, in, in culture for such a long period of time. But maintaining them allowed us to ask very basic questions, such as, how do they actually mature? So to do that, we actually um, obtained tissue from, uh, from surgeries and did a side-by-side -side comparison to see how far in development we can go. And I don't want to go into the details, but one of the most exciting parts of this work is that, in particular for astrocytes, well, primary uh, astrocytes which exist in two states, a fetal and an adult uh, state. And this has been work really pioneered here at Stanford by, by Ben Barris, uh, by Barris's lab. And indeed, if you were to look in our cultures over time, over all, all, almost 600 days or so, you will notice that while in the beginning these cultures are really fetal, something happens close to about nine to 10 months and these astrocytes start resembling postnatal astrocytes. So this is exciting because it tells us that the cells have an intrinsic clock for their maturation, and this is actually conserved in a dish. And this would allow us not just to ask questions about later stages in development, but actually allows us to even understand how that maturation is happening. Can we accelerate it, uh, um, or, or can we understand how this may actually contribute to disease? Now, astrocytes do all kinds of interesting things. One of, the, uh, one of the interesting hypotheses in, in recent years has been that they are actually engulfing synapses. So in fact, we have actually done a three-dimensional reconstruction here showing that indeed one of these astrocytes shown in green is actually engulfing synaptic particles here. Moreover, you can even scale this process up. And we have actually done an interesting experiment where you can actually isolate, isolate synaptic proteins, synaptosomes, label them with a, a, with a dye that is called Frodo, which essentially um, turns red only at very low pH, and then feed that, uh, feed that to astrocytes. And if an astrocyte has actually engulfed one of those synaptosomes, then it's gonna turn in red. If it doesn't, it looks sort of like dirt in between the cells, as you can see here. So then, of course, you can take cultures of this astrocyte and start feeding them uh, uh, these synaptosomes. You see that some of the cultures already are taking up uh, these cultures and are turning in red. You see that some of them are really excited about this. You see this guy on the, on the left was moving very fast, very excited, finally received this meal. But this is actually quantifiable, and you can look over time. And while the ability of this uh, astrocytes in a dish to actually form synapses stays the same over the, the culture of 600 days or so, their ability actually to engulf synapses is decreasing significantly after by nine to 10 months, a process that we're trying to further understand. Now, there are several applications of this work, and I just want to show you two of them that we have done actually recently. One with the Merloch lab here at Stanford, where we have actually used very tiny uh, nano uh, structures that can go actually inside the cells and suck the content of the cells. So we've been measuring, we've been measuring fluorescent proteins inside astrocytes over a period of time. Or work that we have done with Viviana Gradinaro's group at Caltech, where we have actually used viruses that they have actually developed to see how they're actually infecting human cells, because that is important moving forward for gene therapies of the central nervous system. Now, you can also do other experiments that are you know, more difficult maybe to understand, but they're visually appealing. So I wanted to show you this experiment that is one of my favorite, where we have actually done the following. We took one of these uh, brain three-dimensional cultures. We infected and labeled neurons in red and astrocytes in green, and then we cut the culture in half and we put it on top of a glass cover slip. And although we use German glass, which I'm told is the best glass that you can get, you will notice that cells do actually care about that surface. So the glass is on the upper right side. And so you will notice that soon after they're actually plated, these cells are starting to spread, in particular astrocytes, are starting to spread the processes towards that surface and trying to sort of like smell what is happening. Of course, at the same time, neurons, which are here shown in red, couldn't care less about that. Right? And there are all kinds of other interesting things that you can see. I don't know if you notice that peculiar cell division on the, on the lower left, which I think is gonna happen one more time here. Right? Very peculiar type of, of division. And again, I wanna remind you, this, these are actually human neurons and human astrocytes derived from a patient. In fact, these are derived from a patient that have a very specific form of schizophrenia. We don't know yet what it means. We don't know whether this means that there's something abnormal. I just wanna remind you that what this technology allows, among others, is actually to watch how the cells are behaving, brain cells from patients are behaving in a dish. Now, we spend a lot of time 
characterizing the electrical activity of the sculptures. Um, and so we know that there are spiking action potentials. You can see here how the cells are talking to each other using calcium imaging. They have abundant synapses inside, uh, um, inside the uh, structures, or you can even do patch recording. So this is work done with John Huguenot's lab here at Stanford, where we essentially took these three-dimensional cultures, sectioned them, and took 250 micron sections and patched the cells in, in those slices, where you can actually patch on one side and electrically stimulate or optogenetically stimulate on the other side to record the activity. But most of the activity in the sculptures is actually glutamatergic. Now, that is actually not surprising because if you were to think about the human cortex, the human cortex has about 80% glutamatergic excitatory neurons and 20% inhibitory GABAergic neurons. And there is a very, um, a very careful balance between excitation and inhibition in the cortex, which as you can imagine can go awry in disease. So for instance, if you have too much excitation, that could lead to seizures. Now, what is interesting from a developmental point of view is the fact that GABAergic neurons are actually not born in the cortex. They're actually born in the ventral forebrain, in deep structures of the brain. And in humans, they actually have to undergo this very long migration that takes months. Actually, we now know in humans, it takes up to the second year of life to actually arrive in the cortex and then wire up with excitatory cells to make the circuit. Now, of course, our cultures do not have those, ex uh, those inhibitor cells, but what um, two very talented uh, postdocs in the, in the lab, uh, Fikri Bire and Jimena Anderson started doing, is actually to devise a pipeline for creating other brain regions in a dish. And so what they have actually devised is a method for deriving not just the dorsal forebrain, the cortex, but actually also the ventral forebrain, the origin of those interneurons. And indeed, we did a lot of single cell gene expression and comparison to tissue to actually show that there are indeed glutamatergic cells and GABAergic cells in these cultures. We did a lot of characterization of the cells showing that they're indeed forebrain, that they have GABA, um, that there are multiple subtypes, that they fire action potentials, they're indeed GABAergic. But what do you do when you actually have um, two of these brain regions? And this is a new concept that we have introduced, which we coined, um, for which we coined the term brain assembloid, which is actually very simple. And it essentially involves generating these two brain regions, the ventral and the dorsal forebrain, and then actually putting them together to make an assembloid. It's very simple. Now, what this allows you actually to do is to look at the interaction between these two brain regions. So, for instance, you can fluorescently label the two groups of cells before you fuse them and then look at how they're interacting. So you see this after about 48 hours of putting them together, so nothing really happens. But if you were to wait um, for about a month or so, you will see that a lot of the cells, green cells in this, in this uh, case, which are actually garbergic cells, are starting to move onto the other side. Actually, we now know that this movement is highly specific, and the cells from the other side do not move into the, uh, into the, into the inhibitory part. More importantly, even if you were to make uh, a two, uh, an assembloid of two subpallium, uh, GABAergic cells do not move. So this, there's, there is information encoded um, in the development of the cells. Now, you can do 3D reconstructions of this, so you can actually see how they're moving onto the other side, uh, which is very interesting because they tend to move underneath the surface of the other sphere, and then once they arrive onto the other side, then they penetrate and they move in. Now, more importantly, you can actually do live imaging. So we spend a lot of time in the lab setting up this system for um, live imaging under environmentally controlled condition to see how the cells are behaving. And so you see the first brain region and the second brain region, and you will notice how the cells are actually moving onto the other side. Now, I want to zoom out this because I think the way the cells are moving is actually quite peculiar. So you will see that they're actually not crawling on a surface, but they're actually jumping. So, in fact, what happens is that they have a long process that they're used to smell around for about three hours or so. And at one point, the cell body breaks in two, the nucleus stays behind, and then there is a contraction that pulls that nucleus with about 30 microns all the time. It's a little bit different than in mice in the sense that the timing is very different. In mice, these jumps happen every 30 minutes. In humans, it happens every three hours. And this is sort of like the proof that this jump is actually happening. 
Now, the reason this is exciting is because once they arrive onto the other side, we start asking, we can start asking questions about how they're integrating. And this is really work uh, done by Chris Mackinson here at Stanford, who has actually patched cells after they have arrived onto the other side. And we now know for sure that once they arrive onto the other side, they start receiving connections that are not just inhibitory as they usually receive when they are in their home, uh, but they're actually starting to receive glutamatergic inputs as well, suggesting for the first time that we can assemble a circuit that has both glutamatergic and uh, interneurons at the same time. Now, of course, the question that is always on my mind is how can we use the system for understanding disease? This has been really the motivation behind all this work. And my interest has always been in autism spectrum disorder. So very early on, we focused on a very specific form of autism, uh, which is genetically defined, which is called Timothy syndrome. It's a very rare form of autism. We only know of a few dozens of uh, patients around the world. And these patients have a long QT syndrome. They have heart problems. But up to 80% of these patients actually display autism spectrum disorders. Now, what is interesting is that the mutation that is causing this disease is a point mutation. So literally, one letter has been changed in the genome of this patient that causes a calcium channel to become overactive. And in fact, if you were, for instance, to look in neurons derived from this patient at calcium signaling, you will notice that they actually have more calcium going inside the cells when you depolarize them, and this can be blocked by specific uh, pharmacological agents that act on this channel. Now, if you were to start looking at GABAergic neuron migration in forebrain assemblies as the ones that I've shown you before, one of the interesting things that we found is that, first of all, um, surprisingly, these cells were moving much more often. It may have something to do with the fact that there is a gain of function mutation, that there's more calcium getting into the cells, but the cells are actually not just moving too uh, much more often, they're actually moving every time less efficiently. So when you actually look over time over the many hours, the patient cells are actually left behind. So there is a defect in migration, although they're moving much more often. Now, there is a, a, a drug that can block this channel, and I was telling you there's a gain of function mutation, and indeed, if um, you live image the cells and you add this pharmacological agent, which is called nimodipine, on control cells, the cells almost stop moving. But if you add this compound on patient cells, which again, are moving much more often but less efficiently, you actually start seeing that this process is reversed. And this happens um, within several hours. And again, the reason why this is exciting is because um, we're finally getting access to processes in human brain development that we did not have access to before. It's what I like to call inaccessible human neurobiology. Because both human glial development and interneural migration have been processing human brain development that we could not really access at the molecular cellular level. Now, what is, um, you know, what, is, what the future holds for this technology? And, you know, I, I've, I've shown you an example of building forebrain assembloids, but you could imagine building many other circuits. And we've been working um, uh, adamantly on this. And so, for instance, one could make a thalamus and wire it up with the cortex to look at cortothalamic interactions. Uh, we can make a striatum. Um, uh, and, and actually wired up with the cortex to get corticostriatal connections, as well as many other brain regions. And you can use a number of technologies, many of them actually developed here at Stanford, to start to interrogate the human circuits in a dish. You know, we can use um, uh, clarity to actually look at the structure of this. We can use single cell gene expression to start looking at how the transcriptome of the cells is changing over time. We can use patch clamping and optogenetics and so on and so forth. But this is, these are not the only applications of this technology that we developed. Actually, moving forward, there are a number of questions that we can answer using this, uh, uh, d d d using this tissue. You could imagine, for instance, deriving through dimensional cultures, uh, brain organoids or brain spheroids from chimps and humans and starting to ask uh, questions about what makes us unique in human brain development. You can start thinking about how this process of maturation takes so long. Why uh, human brain development takes such a long time. But you can start asking questions about disease by deriving uh, cells from patients or genetically engineering control cells to look like patient cells. You can even start asking questions about environmental disorders, such as, for instance, 
asking how does Zika virus affect human brain development. And the hope is that ultimately some of this technology is going to allow us to do drug screening similarly to what we've been doing in oncology. And there are other exciting applications, such as, for instance, engraftment of some of the sculptures into rodent tissue to actually obtain circuit-wide integration and start asking questions about even more subtle phenotypes that may be associated with psychiatric disease. So although I'm really excited about what is, uh, what is happening with this technology and what it really holds, um, when I presented this work, you know, maybe for the first or second time, um, somebody brought up um, uh, a, an episode of Star Trek and pointed out that this could be highly relevant to what we do. So I thought I'll share this uh, as I'm ending my talk. And um, apparently, and I, of course, I wasn't watching too much Star Trek in communist Romania, but, um, but it, it's actually a quite interesting episode. And in this episode, Captain Kirk, who's really the hero of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, series, is actually fighting an evil planet, only to realize at the end of this episode that he's been fighting uh, three brains in a jar. And so he has this hilarious conversation with them, which I want to reproduce here. So Captain Kirk goes, wow, primary mental evolution. This is incredible. Now, the number two, which is the pulsating green here, responds, that is not true, Captain. Once we had humanoid form, but we evolved beyond it. Number three, which is the yellow one, adds, through eons of devoting ourselves exclusively to intellectual pursuits, we became the physically simple, mentally superior creatures you see before you. So, of course, he responds, a species that enslaves other beings is highly superior mentally or otherwise. Well, anyway, the reason why I'm showing you this is that this is not what we're trying to do. <laughs> so, and on that note, I really want to acknowledge the people who have done this work. Uh, this is a picture, a recent picture of my lab. Um, in particular, uh, Anka and Steven, who have started this technology, uh, Fikri and Jimena, who have built the assembloid system, Chris, who has been characterizing at a functional level, uh, Seijin, who has been developing the higher throughput methods for doing this, and of course, the many sources of funding uh, over the years, including CHRI, who supported me as a postdoc, uh, but even afterwards through pilot grants uh, over the years. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. OK, everybody, let's take a big, deep breath in ah, and let it out. It's quite an amazing journey through a complex system. Um, and um, I think I'm going to need to go back and look at some of those papers to really absorb all of that information. But if you go up you know, about 10,000 feet, you can really see how much um, how much the context of all of those different elements influences the other elements within that context. So now let's shift gears, huh? and we're going to go up to the social level um, and the community level and take the community perspective. And here I have the pleasure of introducing you to Shashank Joshi, who is an associate professor on the teaching line of psychiatry and behavioral science at Stanford. Now, you may remember a few years ago, our community was um, hit by an epidemic uh, among uh, especially uh, high school students, and there was a rash of suicides. And Dr. Joshi um, actually changed a lot of his professional activity to go into the community and see if we could understand and prevent uh, future mental health disorders in the community. So I'm going to bring him onto the stage, and he will bring um, the members of that community to help you understand the phenomenon. Shashank. Thank you Thank for you. being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi, and thanks to all of you for joining us. Uh, so I am going to be speaking today about, let's see. Wow, we got double billing. We were on the previous talk and we're on this talk now. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, suicide prevention, but mostly we're going to be talking about how we've turned our grief from the tragedies a few years back into positive action. And so I'm one member of a community, 
And uh, I brought three members of the community who are going to tell you their story. Um, a brief version about my story is, as Heidi said, I'm a faculty member here at Stanford, and um, I've been doing this work for 19 years or so here. I'm also a parent in the community, and uh, my wife and I are raising three boys, two of whom are teenagers, and uh, I'm also a little league coach, which uh, that really informs my sensibilities about, uh, you know, what are parents thinking about? And um, Professor Dennis Wall and I had a funny interaction. You're going to be hearing from him. We found ourselves together on the same team, but today we saw ourselves professionally. We had to do a double take. And when you work in the community where you play or where you coach, you really can learn a lot if you simply listen. And that's been my journey. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how, uh, as a pediatrician and a child psychiatrist, I've been able to learn a lot from the community and turn some of my grief uh, as a professional and as a community member into positive action. Um, I have a few things I want to disclose. I think this is part of the standard fare of what we do in academia. Uh, none of the things I'll talk about have any financial relevance or conflict, but they are important because I um, do get a lot of support in this work for my program, for my research, for my teaching from Lucille Packard Children's Hospital, uh, particularly Sherry Sager from the Office of Community Partnerships uh, and from the Department of Psychiatry and from the Graduate School of Education. There are numerous people to thank, but I think we can encapsulate it nicely by listing the school districts that we've been in partnership with. Um, there have been so many over the years, and um, not only in Palo Alto and East Palo Alto, but also in San Mateo and in Atherton, in San Francisco, in San Jose, uh, throughout the counties of Santa Clara, San Mateo, and San Francisco. Um, Jasmine, Nadia, uh, Linda Lemoir, who was the district nurse for many years, Mary Ojakian, Vic Ojakian. We've all been doing this work together as a community, and um, a number of primary care providers as well in the community and folks from the city of Palo Alto. So my goal for you today and our goal as a, a community group here is that we hope you'll learn about community-based suicide prevention strategies that we have learned over the years. We're going to highlight what's known in the science of suicide prevention, what is considered evidence-based. And we're going to present some new and emerging approaches as well. And importantly, how can we overcome barriers in implementing these best practices, these positive action ideas that we want to put in place. And so you're going to hear perspectives from other parts of the community. And I'm going to share some perspectives from others where I have learned uh, some stories I've uh, learned over the years. And I want to start with one by um, an author named Michael Riera. Anybody know that name? So he writes books for parents of teenagers. And he has a wonderful website. And I like to borrow this uh, graph from his book. So I'm going to try to point the laser over here. So on the, on the right side, down at the bottom, you can see um, some common stressors that teenagers might face. Now, how many of you are raising teenagers now or have raised teenagers? OK, fair number of you. How many of you once were teenagers? <laughs> so being a teen today, Dennis raises his hand. Being a teen today is uh, in many ways the same as when we were teenagers, those of you who were parents, but in a lot of ways is different. And so what do teenagers do when they're under stress? What are some healthy ways they might cope? Anyone? Healthy ways of coping from teenagers. Exercise. Talking to friends. Do they actually talk anymore? Or is it just texting? Or is it some combination? How many text messages does the average American teenager send out per month? Per day, 300. I got 300 in the corner once. Do I have 500? <laughs> per day, 300 per day. OK. This is a very active text person over here. No, it's, uh, it's actually, she's, she's right. You know, it, the range is somewhere between 100 to 300 per day. That's just outgoing. 3,000 to 5,000 per month, which works out to about that girls more than boys. And so part of what we want to find out is, you know, what are they doing when they text? How do they receive help? Well, typically they're texting their friends. So if we look at this slide from Michael Riera, 
We see a common stressor here, girlfriend, boyfriend problems, right? Pretty big stress. They go into the buffer zone. They might text a friend. They might exercise. Some of the other things that were mentioned in the audience. Um, you know, there's other stressors, exams, life transitions, graduation. You know, the higher the bar, the higher the stress, but mostly there's buffering for most of our youth. What happens when these everyday stressors that we typically bounce back from and where if we have a growth mindset, where you'll hear more from Professor Dweck about this afternoon, um, we can actually get stronger and learn from those experiences because more or less those are in our control. What happens when these everyday stressors are in the context of what Michael Riera calls sedimented stress? These are background things that are very important in the lives of youth, but things that are out of their control. Parental strife, financial stress. It's too expensive to live here. We might have to move. I might have a parent who's going to be deported. Um, there's a lot of things that are going on in my life as a young person that are out of my control. Well, these everyday stressors can then become, they go to not everyday stressors. And the normal stress that teens can bounce back from turns to distress. And the distress, if it's not addressed, can turn into desperation. And so I share this because stress is a part of everyday life and we want our youth to learn how to manage stress. And that's part of what the districts that I put up on the first slide are trying hard to do. In Palo Alto, we were one of the first in the state of California to pass policies related to wellness promotion and suicide prevention. And so we talk about mental health as part of overall health. And part of the reason I'm here with my community members is because we want to put that message forth. The reason we link mental health and suicide prevention is because suicide is connected 60 to 90% of the time with a currently or previously diagnosed mental illness or mental health severe stressor. So we have to be aware as community members, and you here are all part of our community, about what's normal, what's not, and how do I know when to worry. And so if we look at this slide, this was actually put together. It's a concept known as the Supporting Alliance. And it was introduced first at Stanford by, at the time, graduate student Noah Feinstein, now tenured professor Noah Feinstein at the University of Wisconsin. And he was interested in how do parents of children with mental illness get their information? What internet sites do they go to? Who do they talk to in their community? What family members do they turn to? Are there other members that they might not be relying on as much as perhaps they should? And in his work, in his research, he found that very compelling, especially the more chronic the mental illness, the more likely families work to turn to the teacher and to the school staff. Now, why would that be? Well, most of our conditions in, um, in life, when it comes to mental illness, mental health conditions, are diagnosed in childhood and adolescence. It's one of the reasons we were invited to do this talk. Well, what happens, for those of you who are parents, when you go into a kindergarten classroom and you meet the teacher for the first time? What's the reception like? Warm and welcoming, right? Oh, the Joshi family's here. Come on in. Yes, have a seat. It's so wonderful to meet with Sanja. Oh, we have this sign-up sheet over here for volunteering and to be, a uh, to be the room parent. I heard that you might be interested in that. Okay, that's elementary school. What happens in high school if you as a parent are spotted on campus? <laughs> Something like, uh, front desk, this is Officer Dennis or Green. Um, over. Do you copy? <laughs> I've got a parent sighting on the southeast section of the quad. What do I do? <laughs> Approach cautiously. <laughs> well, as parents, it's even more important that we stay engaged as our kids get older because the system doesn't necessarily invite us in. As doctors, it's super important that our um, clinical eyes are not just who we see and what we see in our offices, but that we invite the teacher into our office virtually so we have their phone number. If we have a teenager with depression, we want to be able to tap into in a way that respects their confidentiality. You know, are they getting to school? Do they have friends? And are there important adult connections still happening? And so back to this diagram, Noah Feinstein's diagram, we have parents in one corner, 
we have teachers and school staff, and we have doctors and therapists, and they're all working around the student. Well, there's an important constituency if we think about, for example, teen depression, which places someone at a much higher risk of contemplating suicide. There's a key constituent that's missing. Does anyone know what it is? Peers, right? So peers are absolutely critical to social norms. And when we do evidence-based suicide prevention now, we won't ever get to the 2 to 3% of American youth who have made a serious suicide attempt unless we empower the peers to look for signs of distress. So that changing the social norm in evidence-based programs like sources of strength or youth aware of mental health, there are many others, but those are two that have received a lot of attention in the literature. Peers can move from, you know, if I tell this trusted adult that my friend is suicidal, I'm not getting them in trouble. I'm getting them out of trouble. And that is part of the social paradigm we try to change when we do community-based suicide prevention. So it's important that we empower doctors and parents and we keep that going. It's important that parents and teachers keep their relationship. But part of my role here at Stanford is as a program director. So I, along with my team, train future child and adolescent psychiatrists. And part of what we're trying to help them learn is how to engage with teachers and school staff. Because teachers and school staff are spending the most time with our youth. And this is what Dr. Feinstein found in 2008 and 2009, and that's really held true in our work, not only with kids who struggle with mental health or mental illness, but for all of the kids in school. Now, when it comes to suicide in teenagers, we know that teens in particular are vulnerable to how these stories are covered in the media, in our conversations, among peers. And so this concept of suicide clusters where repeated events, tragic events happen in a particular area over a particular area of time is heavily influenced by uh, how we are conveying this, for example, in the media. The media can absolutely be an educational tool. The interventions that media conduct can have powerful effects on whether that teen suicide is an isolated event or is the beginning of the next cluster. In Vienna in the 1980s, there were a number of studies that looked at what happens when the media gets together and decides they're going to stop covering the train suicides. There was a rash of suicides over many years. And they got together and they said, we're just gonna stop covering this in the same way and they came up with a set of guidelines. Within six months, suicide attempts dropped by 80% and suicide completions went to almost zero. That is part of an international effort now to get media together. Um, there is a website called reportingonsuicide.org. And so when it comes to how these events are portrayed in the media, whether it's in the newspaper, whether it's on social media, or whether it's on shows on HBO or Netflix, there are guidelines. And now there is a great effort to try to bring media together as part of the solution and not part of the problem. And so this work is going on, not only in Palo Alto, throughout the country. In our community, we have about 13,000 students. And this is an exceptional place to live. And I've been here for um, a number of years now. And we're raising our three boys. But when we had this um, suicide contagion that happened, the community came together and said, what can we do to help? And so you have all of these agencies that are listed on the slide that came together wanting to help, bringing their ideas, highlighting evidence-based practice. But what do we look like in the beginning? We had this list of people all coming into the room trying to do the work, and we kind of looked like this. And so over time, um, this slide was... Uh, created by Rob DeGos, who, was, um, who would later become the assistant city manager. But at the time, he was director of parks, recreation, and golf services. But he saw himself as you know, one of the trees in this big community forest. 
And so what he and um, a number of other folks did was said, look, we, we need to get ourselves organized and look more like this, this more intentional community network of engaged adults, activated sectors with invigorated programs that we know work, and importantly, mobilized youth who can influence civic decisions. And so these slides will be accessible to you later. I have highlighted a number of resources that I think are really important, and some websites for you to read more. And I'd like to now um, highlight the role of peers by bringing up um, someone who I met as a student when I was first uh, doing work with Sources of Strength at Gunn High School uh, in Palo Alto. I'm sorry, you're gonna be last. I'm gonna start with Kathleen. Uh, so right Kathleen ahead. Blanchard is a um, suicide prevention advocate and also associate general counsel at Genentech. And so I'd like to start um, with the supporting alliance here by having Kathleen in her role as a parent and suicide prevention advocate share some thoughts about how she's turned her grief into positive action. Thank you. Thank you, Shashank. Um, first, let me just say that while I work at Genentech, the comments that I share with you today are my personal story. So, um, so I'm a mother of three children. My daughter, Chloe, is a graduate of Gunn High School and has graduated college and is now working. My daughter, Isabel, uh, class uh, ahead of you, right? Class of 2016, Gunn graduate, now in her second year at, in college. And I had a son, John Paul, whom everybody called JP. And he was 17 at Gunn High School when he died by suicide in 2009. Um, JP was the first of the children in that time period who died um, by way of suicide. Um, we were shocked and surprised when he passed away. He was very popular, he was smart, he was funny. Um, he was also gentle and he was sweet and he was kind. We heard so many stories about uh, how John Paul, how JP had touched people in his many gentle, sweet, kind ways over the course of his life. And stories came to us around how he, um, you know, was the one who when a girl fell down and, and hurt herself, he was the one of all the children who were streaming past who stopped and helped her to go to the nurse. Um, or when somebody mentioned to him that, that they, were, they had a big test coming up, he would remember and the day afterwards would ask them, how did the, te how did the test go? And, and those were the little small touches that formed lasting memories of JP. The first week after he passed away was all about planning his memorial, which you can understand was quite unbelievably hard. But thank goodness for family and friends. Um, after, that, after that began my search for information. What in the world happened to my boy? We were completely shocked and surprised that he had taken his life. And so gradually over the years, after much effort, I've come to learn some things about him, about the circumstances, but I have to say, um, much of the information um, was gone with him. So we, there's much we don't know. But what I do know is that, um, that there were signs. There were signs, um, which sort of answered the question that I had had, besides what happened to my boy. The next question, so important to me, was whether he could have been saved. Um, and sadly, yes, I think he actually could have been saved. There were, there were signs that he gave out uh, to people in various ways. Um, but at that time, we simply, we simply weren't aware and we simply did not understand them. And so sadly, we were unable to save him. And that's sort of been motivating. I think that's been motivating a lot to my work and motivating to the work of the community. Um, in the early days of shock and profound grief, before I was able to return to work, I took some time off from work, I thought about what I would say, knowing that people would ask me about my children. Did I have children? How are my children? And what would I, what would I answer? Would I speak only about my daughters and, and avoid the discomfort and sadness of referring to JP? You know, what would I do? And I think families that have suffered the loss of children in this way maybe ask themselves the same things. So at that point, I made some personal decisions. I love JP. I'm proud of him, and his death does not define his life. I also decided that I will be open about the fact that I had a son, and that he died by suicide, and that I will not hide him or hide what happened. 
And that's because unless we're willing to speak about suicide, we're never going to be able to prevent the problem of it. We're not going to be able to address it if we can't even talk about it. When I returned to work, a lot of people came up to me, actually, uh, and shared their stories. And I was so surprised to find how many people's lives have been touched by suicide. I had no idea. Um, and every time I speak and everywhere I speak, people come up and they share their stories. And sometimes, sadly, these are stories that they have kept inside silently for many, many years. When JP died, I think a lot of people thought it was just an individual, individual family problem. That's understandable. But when more students started to pass away, I was so grateful that this community came together. And Shashank referenced Project Safety Net and the work of Linda and Vic and Mary and, and, and Meg Durbin and many fine, many fine people, Rob DeGhost in particular, who came together and decided that this was a community health issue and we were going to do something about it. I know I'm running out of time here. I want to share a couple of stories still. Um, there have been many educational events in this community to raise awareness and education and dispel myths around suicide. And I remember going to one of the early ones before I was comfortable speaking. And, and I was eager to hear because there was a, um, a, a mother that was going to be on the panel. And I had not heard, I've heard from professionals, but I had not heard from a mother before. And so I went and and I could understand how nervous she must have been and how brave she was to be there. But at the end of the day, she actually didn't end up saying very much. And I took away from that how hard it is to actually speak our truth and to share our pain and the, sh and the shame that sometimes comes with it as people who don't know us think that we've been bad parents. But unless we're willing to get up and speak our truth and share our stories, um, you know, things, things are going to be limited in their ability to change. Um, I also remember an instance when I was asked in 2015 to be on a panel at Gunn High School. We had just lost Harry Lee. And, and the parents were so fearful and so angry and so agitated. And I remember being on the stage at Gunn High School in the auditorium, thousand parents out in the audience. Um, you could feel the emotion in the room. And I had no idea what I was going to say. And I was pacing up and down. And Shashank was there. He was on the panel with me. And I remember he came up and he said, you know, you'll be fine. You do well when you just speak from your heart. And so, and so that was very, very comforting to me. And since then, that's exactly what I've been doing. And, and I'll end with a little recent story. In, in some of my parent education talks that I've given, um, I've actually tried to be willing to speak some personal details about my son and about things that I've learned, things that I've observed, there's also a group of mothers like me who have lost their children by way of suicide. And I've heard their stories and I've thought about what we've learned from them. And I share some of those. And, and I recently met a mother who had been to one of those talks. I was at the annual luncheon of Youth Community Service. I'm going to put a plug in for that group. I serve on the board with Linda on that, on that very fine organization. We just had our fundraising luncheon. And afterwards, a mother came up to me and she said, you know, I heard your story. I heard your story about JP and his bicycle. And I tell that story about JP and his bicycle and his broken bicycle because it, it, it was an illustration of how something that we might consider uh, laziness or a bad attitude was really actually a clue about how badly he was feeling about himself. And I didn't understand it at that time. And what she said to me was that she had remembered that story and when she noticed one day that her own son had stopped playing the piano, she realized that that might be a clue, and she remembered the bicycle story. And so she ended up making an inquiry and finding out that her son indeed needed help, and she was able to get him help. And so that's why I do what I do. I do it in, in memory of JP and in memory of his loving spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, we're next going to hear from Ms. Sarah Merrill, who's a school counselor at St. Ignatius College Preparatory in San Francisco, one of our um, amazing school partners, and really delighted to have you here, Sarah. Thank you. OK. I took some notes. Um, I was asked to speak briefly um, about a few things. Um, 
changing entrenched cultures and creating partnerships with students and power brokers. Um, when I think of power brokers, I guess I think of the people who run the schools, the administration. Partnership, as Dr. Joshi has talked about, is critical to the work that I do. I've been at SI for 12 years, and we um, have lived through two clusters of suicides. Um, and in my work, I've come to see that once a suicide is complete, there tends to be a great deal of denial that then comes into the system because people want to move forward and be done with it because it's so painful. Um, but the challenge, and Dr. Joshi helped with that and putting in a program like Sources of Strength, was to see that uh, prevention work is just as critical as wellness support services. So oftentimes you can think of it something that we've talked about before, like an airplane, right? You can't just have one wing and fly a plane, you have to have two. So part of our work up at SI was to really cultivate and um, put in, into place a really profound wellness program. So now we have a social worker, um, mental, um, more mental health services, um, clinicians on site, in addition to us, to respond. Um, I've also see, come to see that the resistance is, um, is the denial there is a lot about the need for more education. And the challenge for me is to not give up. So if I didn't have relationships outside of the school setting in the community, it would be really easy for me to burn out and to give up. But because of that connection, I think that um, I'm more motivated and inspired and challenged and have a drive to make this work work, because uh, I'm not alone in it. I work uh, first and foremost with students, and sources of strength is something that Dr. Joshi talked about. And um, part of the challenge is to make suicide prevention fun, which is pretty difficult, right? Especially in the aftermath of a tragedy. Um, but working with the peers and trying to get the message out, changing social norms, is actually really fun, and kids want to get involved in it. So campaigns around the school about um, maybe embracing what your areas of weakness are. Not everything has to be a showcase of perfection. And a lot of the school culture seems to be around always showing how great you are at something or where you got into college or what are the courses you're taking and it's all that. And it's this uh, vast like ignorance of all the other areas that are in your life that you're afraid to talk about. So creating a culture where you talk about those weaknesses, um, they're encouraged to be spoken about and where it's normalized so that when isolation happens, you don't, you don't feel more like you're going to be isolated because you're surrounded by other people who have got, gotten through difficult times. So that's the challenge, is really to make a school culture that is such a high-performing school, or in the Bay Area where there's so many high-performing schools, to also embrace you know, your, your areas where you're not strong um, and that that's, gonna, that's okay. Um, because that's how you're going to get through it. But the kids really don't see that, and um, the challenge is to make it more and more normal. Um, another area I have found to be critical is engaging with power brokers. So what I try and do is um, build trust with anyone I can find in the school, someone I can relate to, someone who I, who I hope believes in what I'm seeing and I know believes in what I'm seeing, and I'll write to them, I'll email them, I'll talk to them, and I'll just make sure that they're always knowing what I'm seeing on the front lines, because it makes me feel like I'm being heard. And then I know policy can hopefully follow from that. Um, what else do I want to say here? Um, pretty much just that prevention and wellness really go together. It's so important for us to stay connected, that we're not alone in this. Um, and I'm really grateful for all of your support. And um, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> St. Ignatius and Gunn were two of the partner schools that really did a lot of important work right after they had tragedy to mobilize their community. Um, next, we have Chloe Sorensen, who I was so eager to introduce. I started off with her introduction. Uh, I've known Chloe for several years now, and um, she's been a very important um, source of strength in the community. She's a suicide prevention advocate 
for youth. She's represented this constituency since she was a student um, at Gunn High School. She rose to leadership there. She really is a was a thought leader there, and she's brought those sensibilities to Stanford University. And um, so she's going to share uh, her story with us now. Chloe. Hi, everybody. Um, so as Shashank said, I've been really involved in this kind of mental health advocacy work for the past few years. Um, and usually when I give these speeches, I talk about kind of my experience with suicide loss and how I've grown from that um, and how I turned it into advocacy. Um, but when I was thinking about this talk last night, I talked to Shashank on the phone and then I spent like four hours like by myself in my dorm room like trying to come up with what to say. Um, I really, I realized I wanted to talk more about like kind of the broader journey I took as an advocate um, and kind of how my thinking has evolved in terms of mental health care because I think uh, it's a lot different than it, I thought it was um, when I first started out. Because when I started as an advocate, I really thought that mental health care was all about the clinicians. Like it's all about if your friend needs support, you send them to a therapist, they get help and everything's good. Um, in reality, the recovery process is not linear in any way and it doesn't necessarily work like that. And if you neglect the other aspects of a young person's life, you can't get the whole picture. Um, so over the years, as I was advocating for more mental health resources on campus and in the community, um, I really like, I kept pushing for that. But eventually I realized that having a therapist can't be your entire support system. Um, and it's, if it was as simple as providing mental health resources to kids, we would have already solved this problem. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my experience, because I'm not in any way saying that therapy isn't valuable. Um, in fact, what my therapist is one of the most important role models and mentors in my life. Um, and she's definitely helped me overcome challenges that I never thought I'd have to face. And after the suicide of my friend Sarah during my junior year, she really helped me get back on my feet um, and feel like myself again. In a lot of ways, she was kind of the center of my support system, and that's what it felt like. I felt like I came here each to a therapist's office each week, and that was really what grounded me and kept me um, on my feet. And I know that that probably makes it seem like I'm contradicting myself, because I just told you that therapists aren't the center of the support system, and then in my experience, it was. Um, and that's because my epiphany about support systems actually didn't come until much later. Um, and it's a funny story, because last summer, I walked into my therapist's office, and she was six months pregnant. And I don't know how I didn't notice that before. Um, <laughs> I guess I was like trying not to see it, but she, she said, okay, I'm having a baby, I'm leaving for seven months, and I'm leaving like the week before you move to college. Um, so I was freaking out, I was terrified, I was really scared, I was like, oh my God, I'm about to go in this giant life transition. Granted, my dorm is only like a mile from my house, but uh, it still felt like a big deal, and I was freaking out because I felt like if she was the center of my support system, everything would just collapse when she wasn't there. Um, the truth is, she was not the center. And as you can see, my life has not collapsed because I'm standing here. Um, and her departure actually triggered a number of realizations for me uh, that I think were really important. And the main realization was that my support system extends far beyond my therapist. And it always has and it always will. Um, and I've reflected a lot about that. And I think the reason I know that is because when I think back to my memories of being a student at Gunn and the memories of facing those tragedies um, when I was just 14 years old, I don't remember th like intense moments of pain or grief or sorrow. I remember the moments of togetherness and I remember the moments of like collective support. Um, I remember all of the friends I had who would just drop everything to go be with someone if they needed support. I remember how often I was the person who needed support and someone would show up at my house at two in the morning with donuts. Um, and I remember how Gunn made it a sign of strength, a source of strength to ask for help. And I think that was really valuable. You know, when I started missing classes because I was having a really hard time, the assistant principal would check in with me individually and make it clear that she was always there to talk. And the teachers, they kept their doors open and they made it clear that their classrooms were a, sp a space for vulnerable and authentic conversation. Um, and most importantly, as Kathleen mentioned, our community really came together. They came together and they said, how can we do better? And none of these moments of togetherness, none of the moments of collective support or belonging or community happened in my therapist's office. 
I think that tragedy really brings people together, and I'm really grateful for the way that our, our community really dealt with these tragedies. Um, and all of the formative experiences I've had over the past few years as a mental health advocate, whether it's raising money for mental health efforts or working with other youth advocates, those formative experiences were only possible because I had such a strong network behind me and such a strong community. And while it's true that my therapist did empower me and help me overcome challenges that I never ha thought I'd have to face as a young kid, I realized in the past seven months that she definitely was not the only one. Palo Alto has stood behind me. We've cried together, we've laughed together, we've grown together, and most importantly, we've healed together. And I think that in order to support the well-being of young people, we really need to create that same sense of community and growth, not only when there's a tragedy, but all the time, because that's what's going to make young people feel empowered, and that's what's going to make them stand up, seek help if they need it, and also uh, use their experiences to make positive change. Thank you. Um, let me invite uh, Dr. <coughs> Pasca back onto the stage. So we've had um, presentations at two very, very different levels of analysis, but I think both extremely powerful um, demonstrations of the importance of systems. And we would um, like to open this up for questions. I hope you can get questions at both levels of analysis. But here's one that's come in. How do the doctors best support schools to promote mental health? And let's see if we can bing that around a little bit. What do you think? Well, there's so many ways now because we've actually had the opportunity to study this probably over the last 10 to 15 years. And schools are really where it's at. We have 12 to 14 million, depending on your count, of children attending public school in the U.S. every day. We're just talking about the U.S. public school population. Okay, you have millions of others who are in private school or homeschool. I mean, that's where the kids are. And so now you've got, we mentioned a couple of the programs, but the way doctors can do it is really part of our training is to figure out what is the best evidence that is culturally relevant for the schools that I work with. If you're a pediatrician or if you're in any sort of child health, all your kids are in some kind of school setting. Even if they're homeschooled, there is some kind of community. And never doubt your power as a parent to be able to um, learn from the doctor, but importantly, learn from one another and go to the school board and say, no, I heard about this program in this other district, or I heard about this program, or I, I heard about it on NPR, wherever you did, and, and do a little reading and take your three minutes of fame to the school board, because th those notes are recorded, and <laughs> those are things that are often referred back to. So I think the question asked about doctors, I would bring it back to... Um, you know, Noah's concept of the supporting alliance, we can't do it alone. And so we have to work with parents, especially when it comes to schools, because parents really do have a lot of power. Mm. Okay. A anybody else have a, a doctors, think about doctors in the broadest sense, you know, health professionals. How would you like, uh, maybe in the work at SI, how would you like the health care community that... Um, um, uh, well, something that I've been more... Um, uh, I guess I respond to now more quickly or, or rapidly is I always make sure that the physician is involved. Mm. So from the school side, I it, just to like normalize that. So yes, the parent needs to know, but when you're talking to the parent, have you have you informed the doctor? Make sure you've informed the doctor. And it's amazing how many people are like, really? Yeah. Like they're a part of this, and it's like, yeah. Particularly primary care, because most of the kids in our schools may not have had contact with a psychiatrist or a developmental behavioral pediatrician, but probably a pediatrician or a family doc or a nurse practitioner, and they can actually be the ones that our youth feel safest with, particularly middle schoolers and high schoolers when depression starts to present itself. Um, one of our students, um, Dina Wang Krause, she did a study looking at attitudes of middle schoolers for help seeking. And she found a difference between boys and girls, and boys do tend to go to their doctors mm. because they feel more comfortable maybe to couch it in a medical model, mm -hmm. whereas girls who are probably relationally way more advanced in middle school as a, as a group, broad generalization, but they often feel more comfortable contacting a trusted adult. And so that highlights the need for the primary care person 
um, and for the, for the family to stay engaged with them as they move through adolescence. I'd also like to share an uh, important role that I've seen the healthcare professionals play, um, including uh, professionals that are already resident within the school, guidance counselors, the nurses, um, play a very, very important role in terms of um, helping in, at the individual level and then at the group level. But the other thing that um, sticks out to me is when professionals like Shashank and, and your sleep disorder specialists and your eating disorder specialists come to school and give educational programs. I really think that's been very, very important because it tells the community that we should be educating ourselves around this. And we have wonderful experts right here who will come and talk to us. And, and when the schools and, and the city invest in bringing uh, these programs to us, uh, you know, people come and they listen and, they, and, and myths are dispelled. I think the, the presence of medical personnel on campus is really um, healing. Mm. So like when I know Dr. Joshi would come by after, we'd have a suicide or something, and it was like, oh my God, thank God he's here. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Any, any student perspective? Yeah, I think I really, like I said, my view of mental health care has changed. And I think that um, what's been really valuable for me is when the mental health professionals, you know, like Dr. Joshi, um, come to the school and not only come to heal, help heal youth, but also work with them. Um, because there's so many young people who want to turn their experiences into advocacy and they want to get more involved and they want to help um, the mental health of their fellow students. But most of the time, kids don't have those tools. And I know when I was starting out, I kind of just had to like figure it out. I was like, I'm just gonna go speak at a school board meeting for three minutes and that turned into a whole bunch of other things. Um, but I do think that if you give kids the tools to make their voice heard, if you give t kids the tools to share their opinions and like share their honest voice in when it comes to like the issues that are on campus, that's what's really empowering. And that's like engaging with the mental health professionals and doctors in a different way, I think is really valuable than just, I'm gonna go to this person for treatment. I think it's a much more complex relationship than that. Mm -hmm. I, I know. I just. I also wonder if you th if you bring in the biological level when you start thinking that many of these me mental health conditions have not a rigid and um, immutable uh, biological basis, but this dynamic biological basis that can be influenced by the same kinds of factors that were on your slide. And so it, you don't have to blame the individual or blame the family, but you can say, you know, there's all these forces coming together. I wonder, does that does that lighten anybody's load? Does it come through in the conversation? Mm. Any thoughts? Is it something you try uh, and bring up? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would say it's, it's in, all the, in, in all the kind of speaking that I would do is, is I really try to, if I'm brought in as the expert, you know, part of what um, Chloe just highlighted is I, I have way more fun going out to the school like not dressed like this, but you know, like going out in a t-shirt and jeans, like I'm a teacher, or I'm part of the school community. And that's what we teach our fellows, you know, don't go in doctor gear to the school, you kind of got to blend in to learn and listen to figure out how you're going to help the school. Before we start any new consultation relationship with a district, we typically take a year mm -hmm. to just hang out and get to know about school culture. Because it is part of this, I mean, they want to hear from us about biological stressors and environmental stressors and genetic stressors, and that's part of what we do, but that's one part. And so part of highlighting, you know, bringing members of the village here is to say, yeah, it's, it's not a simple solution. Just like when you started out by saying it's not just one gene, one disease, and that theory is, you know, it's not nature versus nurture, and we've known that for a while, but so how do you figure out what is in the collective wisdom in the community. And the community has doctors, yes, but it has parents, it has teachers. And you know, back to that alliance slide, like we all have to learn from each other because we're all trying to support the student, but we all have different mm -hmm. eyes on the student at different times. There's a new question, Kathleen, if this one's for you. You mentioned a broken bike story. Would you be willing to talk a little bit more about it? Yes, thank you very much. Um, the broken bike story actually represents a number of things to me. One is that, um, uh, and, and the reason why I share it is because as I think about some of the uh, early education that I had as I was seeking to learn more about what might have happened to my boy, um, I read things around um, what to look for for signs of depression, for instance, and you might see posters around that. And sometimes um, I observed that what 
was on there were things that, were, that we couldn't see, like look for um, if a person has uh, um, lost interest in something, or look for if they're feeling down or bad about themselves. But that's all inside, and, and we can't see that. And so um, the point of the story is, is sort of translating that into the external things that we could see that might be observations and clues. And the other point of that story, and in a minute I'll share a quick version of that story, is um, to tell parents to be open to the possibility that when they engage with their students and something like that happens like in my story, that it may be more than just um, you know, the child being lazy or having an attitude problem, that, that it could be a sign um, that they're, they're more troubled than that. And, and to be open to the possibility that their child is maybe feeling badly and in need of some help. And so the, the, the story is, is that um, one time JP rode his bike somewhere. Every day he rode his bike to school, um, as many children do in Palo Alto. And um, one time he left his bike somewhere, and so I went to go get it. He left it at school, and I went to go get it. And, and as I was taking it from the bike rack to the car, I thought, well, it'd been a long time since I'd been on a bike. Wouldn't it be fun to just ride it to the car? And so I got on the bicycle, <laughs> and, and I could not hardly ride it to the car. And, and it's not because I forgot how to ride a bike. It's because the, the wheels were so, the tires were so flat that the rims were actually crooked. And this is the bicycle he had been riding to school every day and had not said anything to us about the fact that, that it was broken in need of repair. And, and I, I'm a little bit, I'm very sorry actually to say that my initial reaction besides, oh, we have to fix this, so all I thought about was the bicycle and that the bicycle needed to be fixed. But what, what I didn't go more deeply into is, why did my son ride every day to bike, to, to school on, on this damaged bicycle? And why did he not feel like he could speak up and ask for it to be fixed? And, and further, did he feel like he didn't deserve a working bicycle? You know, that this was... You know, or did he just not even think about it, right? So there's so many layers I could have probed um, as a result of that experience, and, and I, just, I just didn't know any better. And it, it makes me very sorry to actually share this story, but I do it because it's, it's important, again, for us to take these, these instances and think a little bit more deeply about them, think a little bit more, be more curious about it. That's, that's basically the story. Thank you so much. I think there's a question in the house. Yeah. I'm just curious if there's any research or clinical work that's done about even younger kids that are showing signs of suicidal ideation and depression. Um, I'm from UCSF, and I'm out in the schools as to train residents and work collaboratively, but I see more and more. In fact, this week, I think I had two kindergartners and one fifth grader that were talking about harming themselves or their family. Um, and again, there's issues around immigration and culture and socioeconomic status, but just curious if that was also being studied or looked at because it is coming up more, more and more that we're seeing earlier signs of depression, mental health, and, and suicide um, concerns. Yeah, well, it's an opportunity to highlight the work of um, Linda and Mary and Vic and Nadia and Jasmine. Um, we have a suicide prevention toolkit that um, is now on the California Department of Ed website. It's also listed in our resources. But that was uh, 30 people in the community coming together. The big um, advancement in volume two is looking more at social emotional learning, best practices, prevention, but also what to look for in signs uh, of distress in, in younger children. And so we, we actually had uh, requests when this newer version came out that now lives on the web to have more on prevention with younger children, um, particularly in elementary and middle school. And so that's just a, a toolkit if you just do a search for K-12 mental health toolkit, um, California, um, it'll come up probably as the first hit. But the California um, Department of Education website has developed a model suicide prevention policy as part of this bill called AB 2246, which is now in California, where one of the only states where if your child is in grades seven through 12, their district has to provide suicide prevention and wellness promotion. That is now a law. And um, so there are some model policies that you can look at in the toolkit as one of the policy. It's listed on the policy page. 
And, you know, what, what I think is important just to add on is that, um, you know, we have the public health level or public education level prevention, and then we have, you know, children coming through to clinical offices, and oftentimes those two sectors are not well coordinated, and I think it's important for us as the, in the medical profession to go to the same website and see the same materials and echo the same messages when we work one-on-one -on -one as are happening at a, at a social level. Let me uh, try this question. Um, so, Dr. Pasca, uh, have you thought about other conditions besides autism and how your work might relate maybe to something like depression? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. And of course, we're still in early days of applying this technology. And so, of course, our initial efforts have been towards modeling disorders that are associated with the stages that we can actually model, which is early brain development and just now moving into later stages of development. So, um, and at the same time, we've been leveraging the genetics, which has really been revolutionizing our perspective on psychiatric disorders, really in the last 10 to 15 years, as we've been getting this long list of genes associated, let's say, for, with autism or schizophrenia. So our initial efforts have been focusing on these disorders that um, happen earlier in development and have a genetic basis that is better defined. But of course, one could start thinking about depression as well, or at least vulnerability to depression. You know, for instance, how do uh, neurons behave from different individuals to various stressors, such as cortisol, um, even if that would be in a dish. Of course, it's a stretch, uh, you know, if you were to think, because we don't have behavior and depression to a large extent, it's such a behaviorally defined condition. Uh, but I think as we move forward, then we we'll learn more about the genetics and the biology of these disorders, these models could inform. Another way in which uh, um, these models could, could inform is actually to test treatment as well. Um, mm -hmm. So for instance, in seeing whether one drug would be better um, than another drug um, on you know, one specific patient. So really getting closer to precision health. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are very simple assays that one could develop um, um, trying to answer these questions. Great. Okay, back to the level of the school. If there were a concerned pediatrician about a child, who's the best person to reach out to at a school? Does it depend? Does it depend if it's a public school or? A I think it would probably depend on your, if I say anyone that the pediatrician has a relationship with, um, school counselor is ideal. Um, but you know, you'll be routed, administrator. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there are a lot of barriers to the yeah. relationship, aren't there? I mean, there's HIPAA, there's FERPA, the <laughs> papas, you know, um, all these privacy things. How how do you work within the privacy constrictions to um, get information exchanged? Well, release of information. Yeah. Um, so just immediately get that, um, and I know our wellness counselors do that, and so that there's a constant collaboration between the treatment providers outside the school and then the clinicians inside the school, so that they can you know, kind of mirror whatever treatment is outside is happening inside too. Um, and I would also say that yeah. the, the relationship that um, the doctor has with the parent, so if it's coming on the doctor's side, it really has to come from us in clinic to say, you know, is there someone in school that you would be willing to let me reach out to? Is there mm. one person, one trusted adult that you can name? It might not be the counselor, it might be a teacher or an advisor, or it might be coach. a coach. But then the coach might be the link to the counselor. And we do have to ask permission from the parents. And so, you know, we're not going to disclose anything without permission from the teen, absolutely. But if it comes to a situation where a parent, say, may not want you to disclose certain information, what you want to do in the very beginning, um, and this is now with the Bright Futures Initiative from the Academy of Pediatrics, where every visit has to include some questioning about mental health and overall functioning. And we also train the pediatrics residents to ask about a connection to at least one adult in school. That can go in the chart, you know? Um, and so if someone's covering for you, you know that there's someone who could be the lifeline, could be the clinical eyes. It starts there, it starts with a relationship. I think on the doctor side, we're more able to ask for parents for permission and I think when it comes from the school, sometimes they're like, well, is this gonna go in their permanent record? Yeah. Um, so helping them understand what the, not. you know, no, people are not gonna have eyes on this. This is really just to support your son or daughter 
because their mental health is connected to their overall health and they have to get access to our wonderful curriculum. They have to be healthy enough to learn. And this is part of that process. Yeah, and, and the question that I, I was actually just gonna follow up on as well is there's that stigma, right? And how do we go and, and you know, attack the stigma of uh, mental health disorders? I feel, you know, even in, in our system, um, for me to read a psychiatry note on a patient that I'm taking care of, I have to go break the glass, is what it's called. And, it go, and when you go into the note, it goes, right? And it, it's like, okay, Several layers of confidential notes, super confidential right. notes. Right. And so there, there are barriers of sharing information even within our system. But how, what, what have you found are um, important strategies for reducing stigma of mental health conditions? Um, so I think that kind of paradoxically, the way to get kids to talk about mental health is by talking about mental health. Um, <laughs> and so it's kind of put hard to push past that barrier at first, but I think if there's anything positive that came out of the suicides um, in Palo Alto is that our community is now very open about it. It's very out in the open. Um, and in my experience, kind of shifting from Gunn to Stanford, uh, people at Gunn are just so open. They talk about their mental health. They say, oh, I'm going to therapy after school. Like, it's like, oh, I'm going to soccer practice. Um, it's a very like, normalized thing. And I think that's incredible because it is kind of, these are the people who are going to grow up and make this um, kind of a more acceptable, less stigmatized thing. And it kind of starts on a small scale and then it grows. But I think um, even just as a mental health advocate, something that I try and do is to be very honest. Like, it was definitely scary coming to Stanford, being surrounded by totally new peers with totally different experiences, and most of them had never, like, ever experienced, um, like, the loss of a friend to suicide or these mental health problems. Um, and something that I realized that it was important to me is to be honest and say, like, instead of lying and saying, like, oh, I'm going to soccer practice, like, say, like, I am going to therapy. And, like, if they ask more, tell them more. Say, like, this is why, like, mental health is important to me. This is kind of my story. And I found that sharing my story and sharing my personal experience has been one of the most valuable ways to fight stigma. And that's a big reason of what, why I do what I do, is just speaking at events like this to talk about um, my story and how that impacted me. And obviously, it's not going to be generalizable to everybody, but I hope that when people hear me talk about this, that they'll have the courage to share their stories, and it's like a ripple effect. I was going to add, uh, I completely agree with everything Chloe said, but I, and I was going to add as well that I think it's important that it's how we speak sometimes about people who are, um, who have health issues, whether it's a mental health issue or a different health issue. Um, uh, as I mentioned, my boy, he died by suicide, but that does not define his whole self. And it's the same thing with somebody with depression. They are not a depressed person. They are a person who happens to have depression along with uh, a sweet tooth or, or asthma. And so I think it's important the way in which we sort of see people and speak of them and treat them as well. So on, on that really um, uh, important note, I think we should uh, take a break and have some lunch together and all uh, share perspectives and conversation, especially in uh, creating an inclusive and compassionate community that we're all proud to be part of. Thank you all for your Thank contribution. You. It was fabulous. Thank you.